Thank you all for joining today. We really appreciate it. As we get started, I first just want to introduce you to Inverid. Some feedback from prior calls was maybe it helped a little bit know about us. We are Inverid Systems, Inc. What we do is we save money and improve health by cleaning indoor air. We provide first cost savings, air quality improvements, as well as operational savings. And then we have some great opportunities within lead buildings for lead points, as well as just the philosophy overall. That's the space that we're in. And really that's why it makes sense for us to be leading and stepping forward right now in terms of COVID and in terms of indoor air quality relative to how viruses and, and bad things in the air get transmitted. I just want to introduce our, our presenters. We're fortunate at Inverid because of the space that we're in and the, and the world that we live in, that we have experts uh, on our team. You're going to hear today from Dr. Israel Baran, an executive vice president and also co-founder of Inverid. From his background as a PhD in biotechnology, he's going to be speaking about viruses and how they transmit and some recommendations in the market for how you deal with viral transmissions. He has his doctorate in, in biotechnology, has numerous patents as well as been published with some scientific papers as well. So we're very fortunate to have his experience and knowledge. We also have Dr. Marwa Zatari supporting as well. She is an Invera technical advisor. Her background is in indoor air quality. So she has been very, very active in ASHRAE. She's a distinguished lecturer there, and she's also been very involved with the ASHRAE 62.1 standard and is a part of the task force that's been stood up to make recommendations and positions from ASHRAE on dealing with COVID and commercial buildings as we come back to work. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Israel and Marwa. Great. Thank you, Doug. Pleasure to uh, everyone uh, joining this presentation, that webinar. And I'll just dive right in. And really uh, what you see here is our goal for today. So as Doug mentioned, we are uh, and very really uh, following all the research and the evidence and the different opinion about the potential spread of the virus, the COVID-19 virus in commercial building through HVC system. So this is really what's, what we want to cover today is discuss that and uh, kind of share with you what we are learning from the research and from the different discussions that, that we have. We also want to discuss and show you and understand different uh, designs and the operation and trade-off uh, of the HVC system that are related to the COVID-19 transmission. Really how should the HVC systems be designed and operate with the assumption that there might be transmission of this virus through the HVSC systems. We are uh, going to present what we are thinking now about that uh, after uh, seeing all this evidence and research, really present our point of view. And we really uh, would be interested to hear your questions and comments. You know, this is an, an evolving situation and there's a lot of research, ongoing research specifically about the, the COVID-19 and then the different opinions and ideas. So it's really important to hear your questions and comments. And the goal here is that as, as an industry, we will come with the, with the right answers for this situation. Really uh, kind of starting uh, with the end and kind of telling you our uh, recommended strategy or the, what we see as the HVC recommended strategy for COVID-19. And uh, we, have, uh, we have four kind of groups of recommendation. And the first one, it's really the most important, and we'll, we'll discuss uh, about this briefly, but I want everyone to know and understand that this is the most important recommendation. This is the consensus. This is what is known and is the real thing and, and the most important thing for the transmission of the virus. It's really a, a person to person and all the measures that we are all practicing in the last few months is the important thing to prevent the spread of the virus. So this is the first thing, but then the, the second thing that we're going to discuss today is the potential spread of the virus through the HVC systems in a commercial building. So we're really going to try to understand what's the different potential routes, what is known, what is still unknown, and is more at the, at the theory. And, and after we discuss that, we'll uh, try to propose strategies or few trade-offs for uh, what needs to be done uh, in the design and in the operation of buildings to prevent or to mitigate such potential spread. 
Uh, I'm already kind of telling you that based on everything that we know and learn, the first line of defense is proper filtration. So if you have a good filtration, basically you can reduce the uh, risk of transmission dramatically. Uh, but we discussed that and other methods. The other issue that we're going to discuss is the outside air ventilation. So we know this is something that discussed in, in many uh, opinion papers and going to uh, explore that and show you the effectiveness of uh, outside air ventilation. And we actually get into a conclusion that this might help, but in some cases it actually can be uh, counterproductive. But we'll get to that. So uh, we're first going to discuss the World Health Organization recommendation. So again, and I'm, I'm just emphasizing that this is the most important thing. The, the virus is really spreading by person-to-person -person interaction. So either really an infected person is standing near or too close to, a, to an uninfected person and through just uh, standing nearby and through a transmission of the virus, the other person can be infected or through a contaminated or infected object. So if a, a infected person is leaving the virus in surfaces nearby and some other person is touching the surfaces, this is a known and uh, there's a consensus around the infection of uninfected person by this route. So this is, this is a consensus and this is really why uh, we are all practicing this uh, social distancing of at least six feet surface cleaning and disinfection and the hand washing. So again, because this is a consensus and this is the main round of infection, these are really the most important things to do to uh, stop the spread of the virus. So now we are uh, going to discuss the, what's, what's we're focused here on the HVAC systems and the potential spread of the virus through HVAC systems. When we talk about this uh, potential uh, route of transmission, and this is uh, based on research that was done before the COVID-19. So, so there's a lot of research done on, on other viruses, mostly I would say influenza, but, but also other viruses spread in commercial buildings. Some routes are, are well recognized and the known routes would be through uh, respiratory droplets. And you can see in the picture this person that is sneezing and drops of saliva are coming through the mouth. So this drop uh, will have a, a, a mixture of drops of different sizes. So what we know again from the research is that if the drop is bigger than five micron, it can travel uh, less than, than one meter or six feet, then drop to the surface. So these are the, what we call the heavy droplets, which basically settle into surfaces. Now, if a person, is standing close to a person that is sneezing like that and these big droplets are hitting the other person in the nose or, or eye or mouth, there's a chance that the other person will be infected. Again, this is not, a, this is not 100%, uh, not at all, but there's a good chance that from this point can start a, a process of infection. So this is really the, the direct uh, option for infection. The other route, again, if these droplets are settled on, on desks or keyboards or, or paper and come an uninfected person and touch these surfaces, again, these drops that might contain the virus can now infect the uninfected person. So this is a, so this is a known route for direct person to person and through objects. Uh, you can see also in the picture, this droplet, this saliva, which is filled with viruses, Again, there can be uh, one virus or few virus or, or none at all. So this is really a distribution of this kind of, of droplets. Now we move to the potential route. Again, shown in some uh, research, but uh, no evidence for that for the COVID-19. A few evidence for that in other researches. And here we're talking about airborne viruses. So the, the viruses get airborne when these uh, small droplets are small. So if they are smaller than five micron, then they are, they are light and basically can stay airborne. And once uh, this, is, this is happening, they are called aerosols. So this is the kind of the scientific name for this kind of drop, again, of, of saliva, which is smaller than five micron and can stay airborne. Now, uh, again, the theory that once aerosol is airborne, it can flow with the air through the HVAC system. And again, very similar to other particles. This is a small particle that, that can flow with the air. 
And if it contains a virus, it can spread the virus from one room to the other room. And this is a potential route of, of infection through this, uh, these aerosols filled with viruses. The other uh, potential route is when they found that the viruses are present in, in feces. So it can be the fecal oral transmission. So basically in the toilets, again, these drops are created. Again, the bigger drops will just fall down to the surface, but the smaller drops, bigger than five micron, can be airborne and have the potential to, to infect other people. Just to give you an idea about the virus itself and some size reference. So the virus itself, and you see the picture there, uh, I'm sure we all know the picture by now, is very small. It's 120 nanometer in diameter. It has these small proteins which have a, have a shape of a crown. This is why it's called the coronavirus. And just for a reference, you see in the, in the bottom picture some sizes of other particles. Uh, you see the big particles. It's 10 micron. It's called PM10. And then you see a red blood cell. It's 7 micron and then PM2.5 micron particle. And then you see a bacteria. Bacteria would be a 0.5 micron. And then our viruses, corona, corona about 1.0.1 uh, micron, and then a very, very small particle, smaller than the coronavirus. So you see this virus is smaller than a bacteria, very, very small. But as I said before, this virus cannot survive naked, cannot survive without the, the saliva or some liquid around it. So the particles that are with the virus are bigger than this uh, 120 nanometer. The virus itself called the envelope RNA virus, and you see this RNA molecule inside the virus. This molecule is the, basically the genetic information. So this is the way the virus is multiple in, in, a, in a human cell. So when it's get to the to a cell, it can replicate itself, replicate the RNA, and create more and more viruses. It's interesting to uh, say about this RNA molecule that this is a very uh, stable molecule. And basically, all the tests that we hear about doing the test, taking a taking sample to, to do the test, are basically testing for the presence of RNA molecule. There's a process called PCR that detects very efficient uh, protocol that detect for RNA. And what's interesting about that, because this RNA is very stable, sometimes you can detect for the RNA, but actually the virus is not viable anymore. So you can say that there's an, there's an RNA, there's a sign that the virus was there, but actually the virus is, is not viable. And this is interesting uh, in different research that we read about testing for the virus in surfaces or even virus in the air where they capture some aerosols and uh, detect for the virus. Uh, when they are actually testing for a viable viruses, they can't find the virus. So the, the fact that there is an RNA or there is kind of a positive testing is not always an indication that there's a viable virus. And again, I'm just emphasizing that the virus only survive inside some kind of, of cover or some kind of liquid around it. This is the, called the, ar the aerosol, the virus by itself cannot survive, it will dry immediately and, and will not be viable. So just, just to summarize what, what we uh, discussed so far, really uh, we are talking now about the hypothesis that viruses can spread through the HBC systems. And because this is possible, uh, it's important that we discuss that and that we'll uh, find the right measure to, measures to mitigate that. So this is why we are discussing that, this is why we are putting all this recommendation Again, although it wasn't, it wasn't prove, proven and there's no evidence, it's important that we'll, uh, we'll do everything we can in order to mitigate that. And again, just to uh, summarize how this aerosol or this virus can be uh, airborne, and this is the problem when this can be carried by the HVAC system. Again, by a person coughing or sneezing, creating a droplets. Uh, some of them are, are large, larger than five micron. They will settle on surfaces. Some are small and will be airborne and can be uh, carried by the system. There is also some possibility that uh, bigger droplets or, or, or bigger droplets actually settled on surfaces. With time, there will be some evaporation of the liquid in this, uh, in this aerosols. And then once they'll be small enough, they'll become airborne. So, so this is another uh, option for creation of aerosols. 
in as in hospitals, uh, aerosols can be created through, through a few medical procedures. And uh, as we mentioned, another option is, is uh, toilets where, where this, uh, again, droplets, bigger droplets, and also aerosols, which are airborne, can, can be uh, created. Uh, one interesting uh, thing that uh, we'll talk in the next slide is that these aerosols can actually uh, be attached to particles. So when you have an aerosol and, and a particle in the air, once they are connected, now uh, a much more stable particle is created. So uh, we, we see, and then there's research showing that if there are some uh, PM 2.5 or PM 10 particles in the air, the virus can stay longer in the air because now these aerosols are connected to particles. So once we uh, kind of know now the, the way that the viruses are potentially spreading in HVAC, I'll hand it to Marwa to, uh, to see what are the ways to uh, mitigate that. Thank you, Israel, and uh, hi, everyone. So I'm going to summarize in the next uh, few slides uh, a brief guidance summary from different uh, organizations related to the virus transmission routes and also HVAC removal strategies. And toward the end of the presentation, I will present uh, some modeling results specifically regarding uh, the efficacy of central filtration and mechanical ventilation in reducing the, the transmission risk. So first, just building uh, up on what Israel said, the consensus until today from the World Health Organization and the CDC is that basically the airborne transmission is not driving the pandemic. So they focus on, you know, the close, close contact. And there are some studies that looked at uh, different cases of transmission. One of them is the Diamond Princess cruise uh, ship. 620 people were infected and the consensus is that the infection was not transmitted by the HVAC system, it was mostly close contact. That said, there is other studies and sort of emerging evidence that COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 can be transmitted via, via airborne, via aerosols. And here, you know, the definition of aerosols and airborne is kind of, you know, arbitrary. It, you know, you can think, oh, it's borne by the air, airborne, and, and Israel make the differentiation of the five micrometers. So this is important to note. There are two new studies that, you know, sort of, they were detailed. One is in the Guangzhou restaurant in China, and the other one is the Korean call center. These emerging studies says, basically, social distancing is not important, but also they say that we don't know about the long-range transport of aerosols. So, Ashri's position about this is that we need to do the prudent thing. Since we don't know how important are the different modes of the transmission, we need to do the prudent thing. And the actual position about, uh, about this is that do not turn off your HVAC system. And there are two basic reasons for that. The first one is that you need your HVAC system to maintain comfort conditions from temperature and relative humidity. And this is important because you don't want to compromise your immunity system. And the other one is that you can use some of the HVAC strategies to reduce uh, the burden of transmission. There are many, many, many organizations out there and many uh, guidance documents. I don't know if you are overwhelmed with all of these uh, recommendations. Uh, that the issue is that, you know, some of these uh, organizations, they say do a lot of everything and some of the recommendations are sometimes contradictory. So the attempt in this presentation is to break down in terms of effectiveness and then uh, in terms of cost, the, the different recommendations. You know, ASHRAE, you can look at it more from design perspective, design and operation of existing systems. Riva is the European equivalent of ASHRAE. And if you are a building manager, there is also the IFMA and, and BOMA that can help to, to navigate how to operate or how to prepare buildings for, for operation. The key slide for my next slides is basically the recommendations by order of effectiveness, first cost and operating cost. And there are three basically broad recommendations. The first one is source control. So we're talking about basically reducing the source strength of contaminant, and in this case, of virus. And some of the sources are avoidable. Some of them are not avoidable. For example, if you need to occupy your building, you need to bring back uh, people to the, to the office. This is unavoidable, or to your lab, or to your you know, hospital, school, etc. These are unavoidable because you have to occupy your building to complete your business. 
avoidable sources can be uh, something that, for example, a leaky energy recovery ventilator. Like this is source that is back to your building. You can avoid it by basically turn it off. We'll talk in detail about it in the next slide. The second one is source removal. You need to invest in first cost and operating cost for the source removal. And this includes, for example, central filtration. It can be particulate filtration. It can, it can be local filtration. It can be something as simple as coil cleaning. The third one is dilution and comes third because this is the most that you need to spend from first cost or operating cost is basically reducing the concentration of the contaminant by basically dilution. So I'm going to go through key recommendations. This is not the exhaustive list, but those are key recommendations that relates to the HVAC system. The first one is particulate filtration. And recommendation uh, among the different organizations is yes, absolutely yes, you need to enhance your filtration. And particulate filtration basically are rated based on MERV, uh, which is ASHRAE standard 52.2, but also you have ISO rating if you're using, you know, if you are outside of the US. Uh, what we know is that the higher the MERV, usually the higher the filtration efficiency. And it really depends what size of particles you're looking at. And this is key. Israel mentioned it, and I am going to repeat it. Uh, what we know today is that, you know, HEPA are very good in removing viruses. HEPA are rated at 0.3 micron for the only reason is that 0.3 micron is the hardest size to remove. HEPA are usually very good in removing less than 0.3 and more than 0.3. You have, you have a range there. But for example, reported HEPA efficiency for 0.01 micron is, is, is very close to 100%. Now, the good news for this virus and what we know from before is that since the virus does not exist naked, you don't need to filter for one, 120 uh, nanometer or 0.1 micron. You can filter well for particle sizes above one micron. The majority of what we're talking about for this virus exists above one micron. And by majority, I mean 80% or more of the particles are above one micron. And the good news here is that because of this fact, you know, the guidance is use MERV 13 or better. So MERV 13, as I will show you later, can provide very adequate filtration of the virus in question. And that's based on what we know today. You know, this is evolving research. What we know today is that the majority will be above one micron. So putting MERV 13 is, is very effective. Second one is UV. UV is a proven technology and can use effectively to disinfect air. So far, it was you know, used mostly in hospitals. I haven't seen, uh, for example, UV usage in residents and not basically an abundant use in, in commercial. Like everything else, it needs to be well designed, installed, and maintained. And here, I, I have to caution something is that UV might not be uh, the right technology to use if you have a coil that's already fouled. This is really important. So we're talking here about two different things, is basically UV to disinfect air. You can put it in, in the room. Uh, I heard some commercial buildings are replacing their emergency light with UV. And there is another application which, you know, you use it to protect and disinfect coils. It depends on your state of coils, you need to consider UV or, or another technology. The third recommendation is about electronic air cleaners. So electronic air cleaners, there is ASHRAE position document uh, on filtration and air cleaning. And there is the NAFA, the National Air Filtration Association recommendation. And both of these recommendations say that, you know, be cautious in, in using electronic air cleaners. One, because we don't have literature evidence that they actually work or they do what they, what they claim. And the second is that the potential of byproducts. And by the way, if you're considering using electronic air cleaners, uh, specifically to fight COVID-19, I've seen a lot of publicity around it. You can ask for the simple test. There is you know, a test from basically the CDC. It's a surface test that you can test before and after and to see if this technology actually works. You can request it from the manufacturer. It's very straightforward and available for, for any technology. Our next, uh, coil cleaning. Uh, so this is mainly from ASHRAE and if my recommendation is that coil cleaning or other HVAC component can have the ability to be basically uh, infected by the virus and there is a potential to be emitted in the air. The recommendation is yes to do coil cleaning, but you have to use a technology that can ensure a high surface coverage. Next, energy recovery. Energy recovery, the recommendation so far is it depends. The problem is that some energy recovery can be leaky. And those not only leaky from operation, they can be leaky by design. If you need more information about this, 
reached out to me. Keep energy recovery ventilation working because it might help you to basically reduce the energy cost of, of ventilation. But you have to ensure this metric that we call, we call it exhaust air transfer ratio. We have to ensure a minimum basically contamination to be back to the space. Demand control ventilation disable. Now comes to the elephant in the room, the outside air ventilation. So the outside air ventilation, theoretically, it seems you know, like a good suggestion. It's actually in every single document I read. Increase your ventilation, and usually they say, oh, as much as possible, uh, or for example, there's caveat to it. In this uh, presentation, I will walk you th through this recommendation. The question is that like increasing your, uh, your ventilation might be problematic for existing buildings because you don't have capacity and might be a cost prohibitive for designing new buildings with extra, with extra ventilation and might compromise your temperature, your relative humidity, and also if you're bringing outdoor air pollution. So the question here, which we will help answer in this, in this presentation, is if you have good filtration, how important is ventilation? So how much vent ventilation will, will improve your, your reduction risk in terms of this disease? So the first line of defense, as Isra mentioned, is particulate filtration. We basically used, to generate this graph, a model, it's called Wells-Riley model. It was first used to study measles outbreak in New York schools. And then after that, many, many different researchers used, used it for, for to do the SARS, to do influenza study, and to see, for example, the efficacy of different strategies. So in this case, we're using it uh, to see the effect of filtration, mechanical, filtra mechanical central filtration, and mechanical ventilation. So this is an example of an office building, 40,000 square foot, and has 200 occupants. On the y-axis is the risk of infection. The x-axis is specifically outdoor air, air exchange rate. So this is not the total air supply. This is only the outside air ventilation rate. And then there's different series, and these series are represent the different particulate filtration efficiency. So MERV is minimum efficiency reporting value. And you know, the, as I mentioned before, the higher the MERV, the higher the removal. And you need to understand the removal efficiency for the particulate size of the virus that we're talking about. First observation is that if you see going from blue to yellow, which is going from MERV 7 to HEPA, or MERV 7 to uh, MERV 13 in gray, you reduce your risk of infection. And I want to caution here is that the risk of infection, you have to think about it as relative rather than absolute measure. So comparing two different strategies as, as a relative comparison. The other thing is that if you look at the gray or yellow, the higher the MERV, so if you are using MERV 13 or higher, it doesn't really depend, it doesn't really matter how much your ventilation rate is. And this I can show you in the next slide. This is ventilation rate procedure which is the minimum prescriptive amount of outside air that you have to bring into your building per ASHRAE standard 62.1. And this is a recommendation if you want to get 100% of your total supply as outside air. So for 40,000 square feet office, you need 40,000 CFM, give or take, in this scenario. And this one is only around 10%, so 4,500 CFM, the VRP. So if you are using MERS 13 or HEPA, you don't need to really get 100% of your ventilation. You don't want 100% of your ventilation to be total outside air. It will not change your infection risk. Basically, and we're talking here about a VAV central system, if you're filtering 90% of your return air through a very good filter, that would be sufficient to have a very low, basically, uh, infection risk. And you can go one step further to talk about the indoor air quality procedure, IAQP, which is a performance-based approach. You use it with air cleaning. And this one, you can further reduce outside air. And again, the same conclusion. If you use MERS 13 or HEPA and your filters are well installed and maintained, to what we know today about the particulate size, this will be sufficient to keep the reduction or the infection risk low. So now, in terms of cost implications, what I'm going to show you here is for Boston, and we can repeat this analysis for different uh, cities. And this is important. We put here the first cost and then the operating cost. At the end of the day, 
as an engineer, as a developer, as a building operator, you have a limited budget and how you're going to construct your building or how you're going to operate it. So I hope that this analysis will help is that where you should spend the money. The baseline here is VRP. Again, VRP stands for ventilation rate procedure. It's a minimum outside air per ASHRAE standard 62.1. And typically today, what you have in your building, specifically commercial buildings, uh, we're talking about you know, schools, offices, uh, we're not talking about healthcare, you will have MRF 7, MRF 7 or MRF 8. The starting risk is 14.3%. Again, it's going to be comparative to the other strategies. And I have nothing in the first cost and annual cost because this is, I'm using it as my baseline. One recommendation to do is to keep the ventilation rate as is, and put better filtration, MERV 13. As I said before, it means that 85% to 90% of your air will be recirculated through this very high uh, filtration level. You can reduce your risk from 14 to 9 and incur some cost. And you see now when you compare these costs to the cost of dilution, it become very apparent is that filtration is a very cost effective way to reduce risk of infection. So comparison I have here, what if a recommendation is to increase your ventilation rate by 30% or go to the extreme, which we call it in the standard as much as possible, to have all your supply as outside air. And you see here, okay, for uh, ventilation rate plus 30%, you have a very minimal risk reduction compared to VRP plus MERV 7, and you incur cost. The ma main one is the first cost here. But then if you decide to do 100% outside air, you have a very substantial cost. And if you see here, basically compare, you can see that filtration of MERV 13 provide the most cost effective versus uh, risk reduction in percentage. Now, if you wanna go one step further and use the performance-based approach, indoor air quality procedure, if you're not familiar with this procedure, basically it will allow you to reduce, allow you basically to take credit of filtration, uh, particulate filtration, gas with scrubbing, other source control, to basically come up with uh, a strategy that, that is unique to your project. So in this case, I show you two things. One is using MERF 7, one is using MERF 13. And the costs here are negative because of the fact that we are considering that if you reduce your outside air from design, you can actually benefit from a reduction in your capex, so reduction in cooling and heating equipment, etc. And the, the operating cost is, is negative because here you're also saving on energy costs. So this is extra ventilation, for example, you can compare VRP plus MERV 13 to IQP plus MERV 13. You know, you have savings on your operating cost and your first cost. Again, this is unique to Boston, and there's a lot of assumptions that went to this model. Uh, but this is, you know, all the assumptions are from peer-reviewed or best guess estimates. So next, just I want to delve a little bit deeper in ventilation. There are two caveats to, uh, to ventilation that are very important and very well documenting, documented even before COVID-19. The first one is related to uh, relative humidity. All the recommendation I mentioned before are under one umbrella, which is basically maintaining comfort inside your space. This is really important. And the way that they define comfort, because we have like, you know, US and outside is something that you are used to. So in the US, we're used to specific comfort temperature inside our offices, inside our homes, schools, etc. All the recommendation under this umbrella. So if there's one recommendation that compromise temperature or relative humidity, you should think really twice before doing any of these recommendations. Relative humidity, beside the immunity, beside that you need a specific range of comfort, relative humidity that is low than 40% actually is, is counterproductive. Because what happened is that a low relative humidity will lead to longer time of viability of the virus in the air. And this is a chart that is really old. I don't remember the date, but it's very old and was replicated in color. If you look at the yellow uh, spikes, those are viruses. And you can see that in the middle, you have relative humidity between 40 and 60. You have the lowest infectivity. Anything below 40%, you start, you start having high infectivity of, of the virus. And there is a leading expert on this, Dr. Stephanie Taylor. 
She's from Harvard Health uh, University, and she's also involved in ASHRI. Uh, you can follow her uh, YouTube channel. Everyday talk is about the rate of humidity between 40% and 60%. And rate of humidity above 60% can be problematic as well because you can have mold, mold issues, basically. So this is really important as we go through the summer and as we start having high temperature, high relative humidity, especially in the southeast uh, region, you don't want to increase your ventilation rate, for example, and have high humidity in your building. The next two slides are about outdoor air pollution, and they have two different flavors. The first one is a study from Italy. And this study uh, looked into uh, the theory is why only a certain part of Italy, the northern regions, the northern region, and they call it industrial triangle, why only the northern part of Italy is getting a high number of infections? This is a question that we have always, like why, why specifically in New York? Why we have hotspots around the world? So this study specifically looked in Italy. It's an Italian study in the northern region. And what they did is they have this theory is that the higher the pollution, outside air pollution, the higher the number of infected people. You can see it in this graph. On the y-axis is the number of infected people. And the x-axis is the amount of uh, times we had, uh, they had basically, uh, exceedance in particulate matter, 10 or less levels. So the higher the number here is the higher the pollution, basically. And the higher the number here is the higher the infected people. And from the look of it, what they found is a correlation between high amount of pollution and high number of infected people. Now you can say correlation doesn't mean causation. And what they did in, in Bergamo, one step further about this study, I'm not showing it here, but they took outdoor air samples. And indeed, they found RNA in these outdoor air samples that basically say that, yes, the virus can be trans transported via particulate matter outdoor and maybe is, is what's leading the hot spots in these regions. And this is something that's not a new concept, like Israel mentioned. It's known that PM fractions, we talk about PM 2.5, PM 10. 2.5 is 2.5 or less, PM 10 is 10 micron or less can serve as carrier and can boost the travel of, of this virus. And, and, and it's not only that, it's like for several chemical, biological pollutants, including, including the, the virus. And the recommendation of the study is that, uh, first, I mean, it's, we have to decrease outside air pollution, but if you live in a polluted city, don't just rush to open your windows if you are in your office, and don't rush to basically have, you know, increase mechanical ventilation without understanding the pollution level and maybe without treating outdoor air. The second one, it's about outdoor air pollution, but it has a little bit of different flavor. This is here from a Harvard Public School of Health. So what they investigated is uh, the relationship between uh, outdoor air pollution and COVID-19 mortality rate. So you see here, there's uh, two basically map of the United States. One of them is particulate matter 2.5 concentration, the top one, the bottom one, is COVID-19 death per 1 million of population. What they did is that they collected data from 3,000 counties in the United States. That's 98% of our population. And this uh, was until April 4. And then they do a fit model between the COVID-19 death and the long-term average of 17 years of PM 2.5. So it's very well, you know, it's a very good data set. So 17 years uh, average of PM 2.5, and 3,000 counties. And then they didn't stop here. They adjusted by population size, hospital beds, number of individual infected, the socioeconomic, and also uh, you know, smoking and other factors. And what they found is that a very small increase in particulate matter concentration, 2.5 or less, and we're talking about one microgram per meter cube, that's very, very small. A small increase in particulate matter exposure is associated with 15% increase in COVID-19 uh, mortality uh, rate. The magnitude is surprising that it has so much effect, 15%. But the direction, it's not surprising because we know that PM2.5 puts stress on, on your system and you know, PM2.5 can lead to cancer. You know? So we know that it can look, put stress on your system. But what's a little bit surprising here is the magnitude, like the number, 15%. All of this to tell you is that 
you know, it's very important when you increase ventilation or you open your windows in, in, in your home to consider uh, the caveat of this. You don't want to make the problem worse than it started. So it's very important to consider these factors when deciding on, on different strategies. Before I give it uh, to, to Israel, if you have a question about uh, air quality testing for COVID-19 or coil cleaning or energy recovery, please reach out. There is a lot of interest basically to learn about the, the different parameters. Uh, Israel, back to you. Great, thank you, Marwa. Yeah, I, I think this is we are getting back to where we started and this is uh, really to, to summarize our four buckets of recommendation. Uh, and, and really the first one and the most important is, is all the following all the recommendation about social, social distancing, surface cleaning, and hand washing, this is the known and, and proven uh, route of transmission. So this is the most important thing. And then we discussed the, the potential of transmission through HVAC, which was not proven, but definitely need to uh, take into account and to, uh, to uh, develop a way to mitigate that. And then our recommendation for, uh, for proper filtration, which actually, if you have that, it will have the most impact on your risk reduction. You know, really uh, comparing all the different uh, means for uh, mitigating the virus against the efficiency of the of the measure and the cost. And we uh, developed this way to uh, to do that based on a very proven model for risk reduction that that is basically can give you the the number or the relative risk reduction for each measure for for different scenarios. Doug. Take it from here. Yeah, thank you guys very much. What we walked through there, you know, with Israel's background in biotechnology and, and Marwa's background and in indoor air quality, it really we wanted to bring forward, you know, our insights from the data that's been out there relative to, you know, to COVID-19. You know, one of the few, very few positives of what we're going through right now is increased awareness of indoor air quality and its impact on our overall health. We're working to continue to, to educate the industry and do our part to help make buildings healthy. I want to share with you on slide 27 where we're headed next with some of our insights. And we talked about some of this today. This is how we're, we're evolving to help you make decisions for your customers and also in your buildings. This chart is showing, again, that risk of infection from the Wells-Riley equation on the y-axis. The x-axis the x is slightly different because it, from the last chart you saw back on, I think, slide 19, this is actually a life cycle cost. So we're looking at risk of infection versus the cost. And then inside the chart, the blue line is showing you uh, ventilation with filtration. So that blue line is uh, VRP ventilation, and then we're showing, you know, various filtration points. So as you can see, the sweet spot there, as you as you come down the curve, that you're really not seeing against against HEPA, you're really not seeing, and as you spend dollars past MER 14 or 13, you're not seeing an, an improvement in risk of infection. So, you know, when we when we looked at this, it was super insightful for us hopefully it is for you and then we we did take it a step further and are showing in green if you instead implemented iaqp with an hlr that you could actually save money uh, in your operating costs so again if you're looking at you know merv 13 uh, you're looking at saving uh, let's call it a hundred thousand dollars over the life cycle in maintaining that same level of risk infection uh, that you would see using HEPA. So really we're trying to shine a light on that, that there are gonna be operational costs for sanitization, you know, all kinds of things that we need to do in buildings to keep uh, their occupants healthy and productive. Why not implement something that could actually help you pay, you know, for some of those improvements? So there'll be more, more to come on that, but we just wanted to share that with you. So let's move to some questions. We have about five minutes here. Just real quick, there were some questions. Uh, so Rick asked, what is the basis of the risk of infection uh, data provided as it relates to filter efficiency and outside air exchange rate? So Rick, 
The model main, uh, basically, main variables are the number of, you have to make an assumption of the number of infected people. You have to make an assumption as of how much they spend in the space. To give you an example, if you have an office, you can say, you know, I don't know, like you have to put, pick a percentage of the number of people that will be employees that will be infected. And then how much they spend in the space, maybe you say eight hours, the length of the day. And then there is one important metric, it's called quanta. So quanta is not a physical metric, it's derived from epidemiological studies. It says about the generation rate of the virus that's also infective. And we have data for SARS, we have data for uh, influenza, for MERS and, and all of these viruses. So if you put this model together, again, it has some assumptions, but you can basically, the, the benefit of this model is to look at, you know, relatively the risk of infection between two different scenarios. So for example, you can decide is that, you know, between only 25% of the occupants reoccupy the building versus 50, how much your chances or risk increase. We have a write-up about this, by the way about the was riley model, I'd be happy, uh, will be happy to share with you. Frank asked, are there independent studies showing that reduced risk of infection driven by MERV uh, instead of increasing ventilation or that's research and very conducting? So we didn't conduct research. We actually applied what we learned from different peer-reviewed uh, studies. Uh, there is a few studies that actually said Filtration is better than, uh, than ventilation. One of them is in a, medical, in a medical facility. They basically reviewed for tuberculosis. So they made a model for tuberculosis and they found that high filtration is better than high ventilation as well. So I will be happy to share with you if you reach out by email uh, the studies. We have, it uh, looks like two more chat questions here. The question from Dave was uh, really about any comments on bipolar ionization, positive or negative. We have not seen any um, third party test specifically on COVID-19 and electronic air cleaners. Not, no, we have not seen any third party tests regarding uh, ozone, formaldehyde removal uh, or other contaminants as well. The surface test and the air sampling are available for any uh, technology. So if you are using or considering using a bipolar ionization or electronic air cleaner or other, ask the manufacturer to provide you these tests. You know, the, the key here is to provide the test for removal of the virus in question and at the same setting or at the same time to provide certification of no byproducts. The key here is to be the same settings, right? The same settings that you're going to uh, deploy it in your building. So if you're designing for a classroom and you're considering any electronic air cleaners, you need to basically have this test of efficiency or uh, efficacy of removal at the same time, byproduct, no byproducts for the same settings that you are designing in, in your building or operating your building. Okay, well, thank you, you very much. If you have other questions, feel free to email them to me or to Marwa in Israel, and we will certainly get an answer back to you. Thanks again. We certainly appreciate it and uh, take care.